Let's see, what layer is Anton on here now? He's here. This is a uh, particular facial expression that I'm giving extra attention to because um, this is a moment in the story where um, it, prior to this you've never seen or heard Anton speak of his feelings about Stefan one way or another. Uh, you've only been able to judge how he feels or doesn't feel based on his actions. But as he's talking to Bunch here, and I suppose it's because he's talking to Bunch without Bunch actually being there. So it's not face to face. It may be easier for Anton to let his hair down a little bit and what he's saying to Bunch right now is, you know, the funny thing is, I liked him in reference to Stefan. He's saying, I liked him, Bunch. And more than that, of my own free will, free will I chose to trust him. So what I'm trying to capture here is a facial expression that's almost he's almost smiling at himself like well <laughs> that's how that one worked out I guess you would call it rueful is the uh, name for the emotion so I didn't want to give him a sad expression or an angry expression. I wanted to show him almost almost as if he could be laughing at himself a little bit. Another wonderful thing about working with the Cintiq is that uh, you can turn it at any angle you want, so it really is very much like the experience of drawing or painting on a piece of paper. I just bless the designers of this thing. There are certain facial expressions that I'm really finicky about capturing, and uh, I call them money shots, because I know they're going to be memorable. I know the reader is going to know exactly what the character is thinking when they see the expression for the first time. But then when the story is done, and people talk about the story, they say, oh, I'll never forget the look on so-and-so's face when. Almost as if they're talking about real people. And, you know, I just think that's grand. And again, in general, women readers tend to pick up on that sort of thing a lot more intensely than, than male readers will. Um, male readers do pay attention to facial expression, too. But women especially look for it. I th you know, there's something about it that really satisfies them. They feel like they've gotten inside a character's soul when they can uh, when they can understand how the character is feeling by the look on his face or her face
Anton is just a gorgeous character. He's just, I'm completely nuts about him. <laughs> and, and when I say gorgeous, I'm, I'm not really uh, putting that much emphasis on his looks. I mean, his looks are, I would call them archetypal. You know, the, uh, the Byronic, uh, sexy, dark, um, gaunt, uh, always a little bit hungry looking kind of a character, a little bit dangerous. I mean, goodness knows, that is, that is a cliché. I mean, there's no two ways about it. So, of course, Anton's a cliché, but I like giving him, you know, subtle little things that, that you might not necessarily think would be consistent with the cliché. Um, certain little smiles, like at one point in the story, Stefan describes him as having this bright little smile like a naughty child's. And he does have that. He's, you know, there's You, you just wouldn't think of a little bit of the pixie in, in a character who's as, as, generally speaking, as grim and kind of dangerous as Anton, but, but there it is, you know, and, and I think that's, that's what makes characters really interesting when they have the element of the unexpected in them. So, like I said, there, there are certain facial expressions that I spend a lot of time on uh, and uh, I know when they're done when when they hit me just right when I can look at the character and say okay his thoughts are now in his eyes there's there's a moment when that happens I can't tell you when that moment happens and I don't think I would ever be able to teach it and it, it could mean uh, the moving of a fraction of an inch. I mean, just as we've been talking and I've been working on the character for the past few minutes here, I've been holding in my mind the words he's saying and just doing everything that I know how to do to um, solidify his sort of self-mocking thoughts in the expression. And people are going to see that and they're going to immediately recognize the 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 combination of emotions that's under all that. I've been drawing for as long as I can remember and capturing emotion was always something that just seemed to come natural to me and I think it's because they were my emotions and I didn't grow up in an atmosphere where people's feelings were um, given a lot of consideration. The, the family that I grew up in, you were expected to uh, stuff your feelings a lot. And those feelings, you know, you have them. Uh, and if you, you stuff them down, they can kind of make you sick. So what I learned how to do was just to put every ounce of feeling that was held back inside me down on paper. And I think, in a way, that, that sort of kept me balanced. I didn't turn to violence and drugs as a teenager <laughs> because I had my work and, and there was something so satisfying about it. I've always believed that creativity is a coping mechanism. <laughs> Great inspiration 
can be inside one and and one derives inspiration from all kinds of sources but for me personally starting out when I was a kid uh, a lot of the inspiration came from the nose in quotes the limitations the the um, oh that's not possible you can't do that nobody does that no no so I would find a way to put it down on paper and make it happen that way and if I couldn't express a feeling usually it was pain or sadness or something like that I found a way to express it on paper every part of a drawing when you're drawing a human being and especially when you're drawing comics and you're you're drawing human beings in the midst of activity every part of the drawing contributes to giving information to the reader uh, you can give the reader so much information in so many layers uh, some of it comes from the dialogue some of it comes from the color some of it comes from your use of light and shadow now see what I'm doing here is I, I was dissatisfied with how thick Anton's hand was down on the bottom there because he's he's a very he's a slender guy and I want to pay attention to always keeping him angular so I I moved I moved some lines there uh, and now his hand is just a little more angular I'm just continually amazed at, at how forgiving the uh, use of the Cintiq and Photoshop is. I feel that in many ways it's enabled me to do some of my best work. I like to say that ElfQuest is my um, ElfQuest is my life's work. It's my it's my mission statement. It's the it's the why I'm here project. But Mask is my masterpiece. <laughs> and I didn't really know there was a a difference until I had this experience. This relationship between Stefan and Anton in the in the context of or I should say hung on the skeleton of the of the Poe story has just been so fascinating to explore. Anton's at the point right now, at this very moment in the story, where he has emotionally closed the gate. His, his last word to Bunch after he says, you know, I liked him, uh, is all well. And with that all well, he, he closes the gate on Stefan. But the story is going to force Anton to continue to interact with Stefan to the bitter end. And so the fact that he has at this moment emotionally closed the gate gets challenged uh, a bit later on 
when when he and Stefan get forcefully thrown together again. Uh, another major influence on me, and I and I never talk about him as as often as I should, uh, was the uh, the great graphic artist uh, Evan Durrell. Um and just about everybody knows his work from um, Disney Sleeping Beauty. Uh, he was single-handedly responsible for the d the design, the the color keys the whole look of that film. Um, at the time it was released, some critics just hated it because it wasn't the typical cuddly soft uh, Disney that everybody had known and loved up to that point, but um, regardless of, of the merits of, of how the uh, fairy tale is told, etc., etc., I, I consider Sleeping Beauty to be Disney's artistic triumph. And a lot of the people who worked on the film agree with that. Those that, that are still alive. Um, and Evan Durrell, uh, with his very sharp, angular graphic style and his... Um, Use, his brilliant use of uh, grays and grayed down tones in his colors just brought a sophistication to that movie that just, you know, sends it right over the top. And so, in, um, in designing Mask, um, I've made a lot of color choices that are... Um, influenced by Evan Durrell. I'm making a lot more use of grays and grayed tones in Mask than I normally would when I'm coloring ElfQuest because ElfQuest is in many ways a very bright light-filled fantasy world and, and Mask of course is Poe and uh, has a lot of grim elements, and so the choice of colors reflects that. So I've spent a lot of time really refining this face, but what's come out of it is that, that I've achieved a facial expression that in the context of the story I think is going to be very memorable. People are going to look at that and say, I know what he's thinking, I know how he feels. So now I'll just finish off the collar of this fabulous trench coat. That just gives me an indication where it's going to land. And I'll put the finishing touches on uh, when, the, when the rest of the page is completely designed. But for now, there. In a way, there's a, a relationship between the way Anton looks in this shot and the ship behind him, the ship that's going to carry him to the city. The, the lines are just very, very 
sweeping and simple and I've kept it very simple on his face as well. In fact I haven't even really stayed true to how the light would really be hitting his face. Um, in the final analysis I may add a little extra shadow here but I'm keeping it very tight and uh, very sharp edged with the shadows. So now that I've got Anton pretty well organized I'm going to move on to Stefan who's on a different layer. Um, this is kind of a simultaneous thing. This is a this is a reaction shot on Stefan that's been roughed in. Um, he has just discovered that the, the object he has stolen, which is the, the immortality formula that Anton came up with, and Stefan copied it onto a chip, he has just discovered that what he stole has now been stolen from him. He had some good intentions. He was giving some very th strong thought to uh, bringing it back. Um, but now it's out of his hands. Now he can't. So I just finished uh, doing an expression of sort of resigned, rueful emotion on Anton, and what I have to show on Stefan here is a look of um, shock, almost horror, if you will. And this is a panel where there's no dialogue at all. Um, this is a panel that's taking place simultaneously as Anton is talking. So I can only tell the story in this panel through the facial expression. So the reader has to be able to look at this and realize that Stefan has just rifled through his pants pocket and has just realized to his horror that the chip is missing. Stefan is, I don't know, of the two in, in some ways he's the more interesting character to work with because he's actually less of an archetype than Anton is. Um, one reader described Stefan as uh, the wounded child, the broken child, and I thought that was really accurate, a, a really good way to look at it, but wounded children act out in different ways. Some of them get majorly depressed and and retreat from the world. Uh, some of them get violent. Some of them get nasty and try to wound others uh, before others can wound them when they become adults. Uh, you know, w wounded children come in all kinds of packages. Um, what's interesting about Stefan is that he does actually seem, despite all odds, to have some kind of internal moral compass. He knows when he's doing something wrong, and very early on in the story, it was his desire to turn over a new leaf. And a lot of the reason for that was, was his deep and passionate obsession with Anton. He's, I mean, he really is deeply in love and can't comprehend why that love isn't being returned, which is the childlike side of him, you know, because a child really tends to believe in tit for tat and that, well, you know, that's not fair if, if you're not doing the same thing I am. But but that is Stefan's Achilles' heel. He's, he's extremely 
immature in that regard. Um, in other ways, he's quite sophisticated. He's he's got quite a past. He's been a male concubine since he was 15 years old, and he's made a living that way as a thief and con artist, and uh, he's seen a lot of the world. But instead of it making him hard and, and brittle and cunning, um, something of his innocence survived, which I think is what makes the character so tragic. He really wants to do the right thing, but there's, there's something in his makeup that sort of uh, trips him up every time. I was just thinking that the very first, oh, I guess you could call it novella I ever wrote was in high school when I was around 16 years old. And it was, it had a, a gay protagonist. And it was a uh, science fiction story about an astronaut who is part of a group of miners that goes to various planets to mine ore and uh, on this particular planet uh, the, the miners discover a group of aliens living there that, that are these rather beautiful sort of winged bat-like humanoid aliens and the the lead character, the the gay astronaut, falls in love with the leader of the aliens who just doesn't get it. You know, not only is he not human, he's not gay. So he doesn't get it. And the whole story is about the astronaut's frustration at not being able to communicate with the alien and also trying to save them and their society from the miners coming and just destroying their environment. And it has a tragic ending. Things don't work out well. But I, but I was thinking that, you know, uh, maybe there is a little bit of that long ago character in Stefan who, who tries to communicate his feelings and is frustrated and, and surprised and hurt and all kinds of different emotions when, when those feelings aren't returned it's exactly as he expects. What's, what's ironic is he doesn't understand that he's probably gotten from Anton more than any anybody ever has gotten from Anton or ever will because Anton genuinely liked him. And, uh, but Stefan couldn't see that that was, that was the cornucopia. <laughs> okay, so eyes. I am going to use a guide for the eyes here because I want them to stay very, very round. That always helps in a look of surprise. Stefan has green eyes, and, and I freely admit that that is a uh, tip of the hat to the fact that, that the uh, note he hits the strongest in the story is jealousy. <laughs> so he's, he's got the green-eyed monster going on.
funny thing I learned about eyes a long time ago is that even though technically they are perfectly, pupils are perfectly round, they shouldn't hardly ever be drawn that way. They should always be a little bit distorted. You know, for example, in a shot like this where a character is showing surprise, almost perfectly round, but just a little, a little off, a little stretched, makes the emotion of surprise seem more intense. And again, I don't know why that's so. I just know it's so. <laughs> it's, it's certainly not a hard and fast artistic rule. All right, so the look of surprise is starting to emerge here. And the highlights are very important because it really tells you what direction the eye is looking in. Now he's he's got quite a bit of work in terms of shading on his face already, so I'm not really going to do too much more with that. When I rough a character in, very often I'll put the shading and shadows in rather in a rather finished mode and and uh, then finishing off the character very often is just a matter of placing the line work that tightens it up You have to be careful with mouths. It's really easy to overdo them. Now, at this point, I'm going to try something that I may not like, so I will save what I've got and go back through history if I don't like it. But I'm going to try opening his mouth a little bit, because that too contributes to the expression of surprise. But for some shots, and I don't know why, it can look kind of dumb. <laughs> so I'm going to see if this looks dumb or if it contributes to surprise. And I actually kind of like what I'm seeing. When a character is surprised and the lower jaw drops open slightly so that the bottom teeth show, I don't know why, but it, it somehow makes them look a little more vulnerable. I remember a group of British archaeologists did a test like that in the Amazon, they were, they were actually trying to find out if human facial expression was universal. So they had a bunch of photographs with them of different human facial expressions, fear, joy, uh, hate, love, uh, you know, just 
a whole bunch of stuff. And they went out into the Amazon and they encountered a tribe, primitive tribe there, uh, that they were able to communicate with and and they sat down and and showed these pictures one by one and said do you know what is this person feeling and they asked them to tell a story about the picture so when when they showed them a picture like this with a person with an expression like this one guy said oh um, he is being chased by a big cat uh, and, and in other words, all the stories that they came up with were fear, the, that the guy is afraid of something. So the conclusion that the archaeologists came to is that human beings are hardwired uh, pan-culturally to recognize certain spa facial expressions and be able to name them specifically. Um, I suppose that's a very good argument for why the human race ought to be able to get along. <laughs> you know, because there are certain things that, you know, no matter whether we are headhunters or kabuki dancers, we have in common. Okay. Now, I just realized I have to remember that Stefan's hair is wet here because he just got out of the shower. So I have to show a few of those sexy trailing tendrils stuck to his skin. Which nobody is going to uh, wish I hadn't done. <laughs> very very interesting to come up with a character that others consider to be eye candy because of necessity a character like that usually has very regular features that that fall into the category of you know what someone would call it beautiful and beauty without character can be really vapid <laughs> So, with Stefan's reputation for being, you know, one of the most sought after and divinely beautiful creatures on the planet, well, of course, his features are going to have to be very, very regular. But how do I keep him from being vapid? I, I mainly do it through his facial expressions. Um, they're they're complex. And and he shows different sides of himself. just a little. So now we have sort of terry cloth texture. Now this is a very, very simply cartoonishly drawn expression, but it is exactly what I want and I am not going to mess with it. I am not going to fuss with that much more detail. Because when it says what you want to say, leave it alone. I'm going to make this cheek line here a little less harsh. There we go. Just soften that a tad. There we go. That won't be so jarring now. Oh yeah. So this so this expression is equally as graphic as Anton's in its way, but it's an entirely different emotion. This is um Stefan reaching into his pants pocket and discovering that the
chip is no longer there. But I remember looking at this a couple of days ago and being dissatisfied with where the knuckle was. So I'm just going to move that up. It's funny the things that bother me and the other things that I let go because many times you would think it would be just the reverse, but... <laughs> There are just certain little things I can't let go. Alright, let's get that color a little more accurate. Mm-hmm. I don't use models. I pretty much make things up as I go along and um, I find that by not using models, regardless of how accurate the artwork is or the anatomy is, it, it has sort of its own integrity. But I think that's how a cartoonist basically thinks. A cartoonist isn't really thinking about 100% uh, realism so much as coming up with a satisfactory caricature that conveys all the information you want. <laughs> 